Geopolitics and Empire is joined by author Paul Rosenberg of the Freeman's Perspective, a great newsletter on all things relating to freedom and liberty. He has been deeply engaged with crypt cryptography since the first cypherpunk era and wrote the first protocols for law and cyberspace. He's also co-founder of Crypto Hippie Anonymous VPN. I've been reading his musings for over a decade, often on Lou Rockwell, where they are reposted, where I have also had some of my own writings posted way back before the podcast uh, began. We'll be getting his take on the political situation today, the economy, how to protect uh, our privacy and live freely. Uh, Bitcoin, the techno technocracy endgame, or as he calls it, the, um, I, I believe, techno serfdom, and whatever else is on his mind. And before we continue, I have an important update regarding the Geopolitics and Empire podcast. Our most recent podcast interview with Dr. Circus was taken down by YouTube and we were given our first strike. I'm confident that in the near future, our YouTube channel will be deleted. Patreon is going to terminate our account as well. And Reddit removed our most recent post linking to the podcast. So I simply launched a preemptive strike and terminated my Reddit account. The good news is that we have three excellent video platforms on which you can freely continue to view the podcast, and those are BitChute, Brighteon, and Odyssey, or LBRY. I'll also be uploading to Rumble and Brand YouTube in the future. And the podcast remains freely available on the audio podcast ecosystem, which includes SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else. We're also on all of the alternative social media, such as MeWe, Minds, Gab, Float, Telegram, and VK. I would really recommend you stop listening to us on YouTube and move to the other channels, bookmark geopoliticsandempire.com, and sign up to the free email list so you can always be informed of each new podcast. You can still support us on Subscribestar via crypto and PayPal. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. How is 2021 treating you so far? <laughs> well, it, weirdly, but I, we're very well. Thank you. All right. It's good to hear. Uh, perhaps we can start by getting your take on uh, the political situation uh, in the U.S. or if you have thoughts uh, beyond that. Uh, you know, apparently the transition of power went peacefully and, you know, civil war hasn't broken out, at least not yet. You've called 2020 the year the system showed its true face with all of these, you know, authoritarian measures we have now sadly become accustomed to. Uh, other guests I've had on, such as the American uh, C.J. Hopkins, who's based in Germany now, he's echoed your exact same sentiments that the powers that be have finally decided to take off the mask. And, you know, it feels like we took a one too many wrong turns and we're completely lost now. Uh, in the forest, it's getting dark and strange noises are now beginning to sound. So, you know, uh, could you tell us a little bit of, of, of your thoughts of where we are and what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting moment. You know, what we just went through um, to just to simplify things was the first televised plague. Now we can add all the, you know, commentary about how it was blown out of proportion and all of that, which is true. Uh, but it was the first time that we had this weaponized media system uh, that was just throwing everything in everybody's face. And a big part of the political situation in the U.S. now is that a very significant percentage of the population are terrified and are sitting in front of CNN every day finding out what they should be afraid of. Um, that really complicates things. And last year, 2020, was really the peak of it. It's starting to wind down a little bit now. And the question of the moment to me is how quickly these people will get over it, how they will get over it, and what happens when they start to feel real pain and the and it seems like the crisis is at least alleviating so somewhat. That's a real interesting set of things that are all kind of flowing together. Um, and it's hard to tell exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the people that I see, which I, you know, I, I, I have the problem of, of most of my work goes on inside my head and I sit in my office and, and you know, peck away at a keyboard. Uh, but I do try to get out and see, you know, actual people with actual jobs. 
and um, they seem to be doing fairly well. Uh, but they're, gosh, there's sure a lot of people who have been monetarily destroyed over this thing, and still a lot of people that are just cowering in their homes. So, to me, those are the things to really watch. Power has just gone crazy. Um, they've the middle officials, the governors and the mayors and the so on and so forth, they went nuts in 2020. They got their hands on real power and they liked it. They shut down churches and synagogues. And, you know, you may not, you, one of the governors in the U.S. decreed that people could not buy seeds. You could not go to the store and buy seeds and plant tomatoes in your garden. Now, you know, what the hell is that? That's just that's just, you know, a mania on, uh, of a power maniac. Um, but we had a lot of it, and it's going to be very interesting to see what these people do next because they're insulated in their little world, and they don't even know it. And, you know, they've, they've built, um, gosh, uh, barbed wire walls. Uh, around Washington, D.C., for which was a very minor uh, sort of incursion. You get the, if you actually look at the, at the video of what these people did when they got in, they held a prayer service, for God's sake, in, in uh, I guess it was the Senate chambers. I mean, they had a prayer service. These were not people who were trying to, you know, maim and kill. Um, and But the D.C. crowd, they are taking this like it was, you know, Chinese army marching in with AK-47s in their hands. Um, so I think they're just out of, out of orbit over mm -hmm. there. So in that situation, there's, there's, you know, there's a mania to power and they're in it and you don't know what they're going to do next. If they really do try to take away guns from Americans, then there will be death. And that could be really dangerous. So the ugly thing about 2020 and 2021 intellectually is that we're in between. We just have to kind of wait and see what falls to the ground first. And it's kind of, um, from, my, from my perspective, it's a little frustrating because I'm saying, okay, well, which way is it going to go? And it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, as you said, I, I think we've seen things that we never would imagine, especially, you know, a lot a lot of the, the things that you, you mentioned are diametrically opposed, you know, to to Americana, to, you know, yeah. the, the, the traditional constitutional, you know, America that, do, that uh, you know, that I grew up in um, and that uh, to an extent, you know, that, that I've known. And as you said, it's kind of uh, scary because these people now, these these, these middle managers, as you say, will will this uh, dictatorship uh, remain you know will we just grow accustomed to it like as has happened in past regimes in in history or as you say will they pull pull back uh, um, some of this authoritarianism but then we're going to have like you know the consequences of this uh, crash of the economy uh, or these you know so socio political uh, socio cultural issues uh, of civil war and so um, you mentioned the guns as well. I think Biden just went, he just passed something about uh, some school shooting from three years ago, using that as a justification now to go after uh, guns. And so do you see this real potential for some kind of a civil war s scenario or, you know, w w what could possibly happen? Well, it's interesting to see what's going on now in that the middle officials uh, are all of a sudden getting hit in the face with budgets. And because of the lockdowns, the house arrest of, of you know, half the populace or more uh, over the last year, their tax income has tanked. And uh, they can't print money up like the feds can. And so they're, they're now stuck where they are having to open back up because they need the tax revenue. They need the sales tax. They need all the various use taxes, whatever. You know, there's a hundred of them in any given jurisdiction. Um, and they need those back because money from the feds hasn't been fast enough coming. Uh, the money masters in D.C. and New York are a little bit worried about kicking off inflation. 
uh, so they're trying to cut back. Um, and these guys are running out of money. They're stuck with the unions who really run municipal government, not politicians. It's the unions who actually determine what happens in municipal government most of the time. Um, the unions are going to be in trouble because if they're not working, they're not putting into their pension funds and their pension funds are massively uh, in trouble. Um, so they've got that. Uh, and so they're being forced to open things up. And I've been kind of happy to see, again, normal, regular people, people that you see, you know, in a store or at, the, at a gym or somewhere like that, who are seeing through the BS that's been going on for the last year and know that things are seriously awry. And there's going to be pain coming out of this. There already is. And pain, sadly to say, does wake humans up. Um, so things are turning. Um, the DC insulated crowd are, are nuts. I mean, the Europeans are probably worse with you know the Brussels crew. My God, these people are, are really divorced from reality. Um, but i am been kind of happy with the responses that I see in my little slice of the world. Uh, that people are saying, you know, there's a whole lot of BS going on out there, and uh, I, I'm not really a fan of it. But I, you know, I, I have to go along. My wife is scared. My this, my that, um, and we have to kind of go along with it. But I know it's nuts. So that's a nice first step to me because when you have people that have an emotional investment of you know, wearing masks, you know, at some point it became. Good people wear masks, bad people don't. And when you get people buying into that and associating their self-opinion with that, their self, their judgment of themselves, I'm a good person because I, and you put a fill in the blank, and if it says wear a mask, it's really hard for them to say, you know, maybe we were getting a little overboard. But I'm seeing people do it, so I'm happy about that. And... Um... The question about w war uh, as well, because often, you know, these things are interlinked and you wrote an article I saw back six years ago, uh, I, I believe saying, you know, war was coming. And I I've been thinking the same thing for many years. You know, I'm, I'm anti-war. In fact, next week I'm talking to Scott Horton of antiwar.com, who published a new book on the global war on terror. And um uh, I've talked with Francis Boyle recently, who who thought you know war with Iran could be uh, imminent. Uh, in fact, yes, because Scott Horton just in his book talks about how war with Iran has been planned since 1996. And so you know, often when there are domestic issues, uh, they start wars uh, with you know they create these foreign enemies. Did you? What's your view on the near term potential? You know, like uh, with another war starting with I Iran or you know. God forbid Russia or China. Well, I don't think there will be war uh, with Russia because the Russians don't want war. Um, and uh, I, it, it's interesting. They've been trying to stir up a war with, with in Syria for sure since 2005, maybe 2004. Uh, they've been trying to make trouble with Syria and take it down. Um, they haven't succeeded, which is really, which is really uh, hopeful. Um, they've been trying to stir up trouble with Iran, um, and that hasn't particularly gone too well. From you have to remember, Iran does real business with 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 other real countries. Their leadership is nuts, but you know, so is the leadership of most places nuts. Um, but they do a lot of business. Iran does a lot of business with Israel, believe it or not. Uh, so Iran is not just an oil uh, sheikdom. Uh, it's an actual country where people actually, you know, produce things uh, and not just oil. So um, they haven't been able to get a, a good war going in a while. Uh, and I'm really happy about that. The Chinese are always... Uh, an issue they very very much want Taiwan. Um, it's a it's an emotional and psychological thing for many of them, uh, and I think for the leadership. Um, 
But, you know, it's so hard to say. The information we get is so partial and it's so filtered. We really don't know what's really going on in these things. Um, the reports we get are, are, like I say, are usually uh, written for public consumption. Uh, so it's hard to tell what's really going on behind the scenes. I once had a, a conversation, I'll pass this along, with uh, the, one of the, well, most highly regarded geopolitical analysts on the inside, um, a man by the name of Alex Alexiev. He was a friend. And I talked to him once and I said, Alex, okay, look, I know a little bit about this or that. You know a, little, a lot more about a lot of things. Is there anybody who can really see the whole picture and know what's really going on? He says, no, Paul, well, there's no one. No one knows what's really going on. And you know, we're all just making our guesses. Hopefully they're good guesses, but no one really knows what's really going on. And this was, you know, the number one uh, Soviet analyst at the Rand Corporation. And so I have to, you know, y y people don't really know what's going on. We, we have ideas. So hopefully some of ours are better than others. Um, but it's really hard to say what's really going on. I've been very happy that there haven't been any serious wars in a while. Um, that's, that's really a good thing. Even the Middle Eastern stuff has been primarily desert warfare, which is not particularly too difficult and uh, not particularly too deadly. God help us if we have wars in cities. You, you know, that was an extremely uh, valuable insight you just gave about no, no one knows what's going on. And I've been coming to that conclusion my, myself because I follow a lot of newsletters, a lot of experts. Uh, I'm interested in it. And I think that helps, you know, help, helps me conduct the podcast. And I've, I've kind of, you, you know, I even question my own theses. And it's just like, yeah, you know, we kind of, at the end of the day, you know, we can have information and look at that expert in this perspective, but it's really like, we don't no one knows what's going on <laughs> and there are different va variables that can you know all kinds of variables that can change things at, at any moment and i i thought um you know we could talk about something you've been writing a series of articles uh, on this subject and I i've been greatly impacted uh, uh, on this subject and i think a lot of my guests that i've been talking about talking with uh, have as well this 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 great reset this technocracy scientific dictatorship you know you call it the techno serfdom uh you know just yesterday i got off the line with uh dr mark circus he's based in brazil um that'll be published uh, soon and you know he, he was revealing how he was you know greatly impacted emotionally by witnessing the these things that are happening uh we, we spoke to scientist Den denis rancor from canada uh, who, saying the same Italian architect from Rob, uh, Robin Monotti, we recently spoke to, which is on the channel people can listen to. And, you know, you, you've, we've all been discussing this kind of potential coming dark age, you know, this dystopian technocracy that's apparently uh, before us. And, you know, you wrote about your articles, like what's coming at us um, and where cash, they want to eliminate cash, have full control of commerce, and uh, the internet will become this universal surveillance network. And you interestingly pointed out that John von Neumann, uh, the scientist who inv invented computer programming and AI, saw it coming in the 1940s. He said, quote, what we are creating now is a monster whose influence is going to change history, provided there is any history left, end quote. So, you know, what's your feeling on, could you tell us about the road to not serfdom, but techno serfdom? Yeah, um, great subject. Uh, we are in a position right now of real serious danger. Um, far more important, far more dangerous than tip traditional, you know, war, tanks and bombs and so on, is surveillance and not just surveillance, but manipulation. It's important that people understand this. And, and <sighs> I apologize to everybody in advance for what I'm about to lay on you because it just seems overwhelming, and I'm sorry. Um, when you pull up YouTube, you should do this as an experiment. Pull up YouTube on your you know, smartphone, whatever you got, and pull up your page and see what it looks like. Then go over to your friend. Hey, Jimmy, pull up YouTube on your thing. 
just youtube.com, the main page, what do you see? You're going to see different stuff because you are already getting personalized content. They sell that under, oh, yeah, well, we're going to give you ads. BS. This is manipulation. This is what they do. If you're Google, if you're Facebook, you are the greatest spy systems that were ever created. Everyone who uses Facebook is deeply surveilled on a permanent basis. Every quote, every, every quote you put, every letter you type is analyzed. They've been doing this for years. I mean, they ran an experiment on people to see if they could change their moods in, in 2012. And it worked. And not only changed their moods, but it changed their friends' moods. This is what they sell. This is what they do. It's not an accident that the boss of the FBI used to have an office at Facebook. Maybe still does, for all I know. It's no accident that the CIA and others uh, funded Google. Um, these are the internet is now, and if you use a smartphone and social media, you are being manipulated right now, every day. I don't care if you don't know it. I don't care if it doesn't seem like it to you. It's true. How else do they bring in a hundred billion dollars a year? It's probably more like two hundred now. They're selling you. This is what they do. So this is the threat. And if they get that going, even better, which they're working on it all the time. Um, I've written books on this. If anyone wants to see it illustrated by my book, The Breaking Dawn, it'll scare the crap out of you. And the other part of the book will make you uh, hope for the future right away because it, there's part of it that's going to be glorious. Um, but this is what's going on right now. And this is the threat. This is the problem. Because people are addicted to this stuff because that's what they do. They addict you on purpose. That is their job. They know it. They do it purposefully. And so this is, this is the threat. And what they'll have to do uh, if they want complete control, which, of course, there's never enough control for somebody who's a control freak. They always want more. Any excuse, any, anything to get more control, they'll take. So what they're going to have to do now is to get rid of cash uh, because it's non-controllable and they can't get more information out of it. That's the, one of the things with credit cards and such things is it's not only that they can control it, it's that they know what you're buying when you're buying it. That's why the Europeans are so big on financial controls because they don't have such good access to Google and Facebook and they can with financial control, knowing exactly what you spend, where, how, at what time, after you met with whom, they have now control. Um, and this is what they want. So they need to get rid of cash. Um, the real scary scenario of what they will do to get what they want is to purposefully crash uh, the stock markets uh, and whatever else. And then say, come in and write in as the savior, saying, oh, I know things are bad. You're in debt up to your eyeballs, which most people are. Um, never, never have regular people ever been in debt like they are now. I, I, there's no time in history that I can think of even close to where normal working people were in debt the way they are now. So if they crash the system uh, and get rid of all that excess wealth, they can write in as a savior and say, look, you're in big trouble. We all know it. Everybody's in the same boat. It's not just you, but we have a solution. We're going to give you our new type of bank account, and you have to come with us, uh, and we'll give you the account. And by the way, if you do that, we'll cancel your mortgage. We'll cancel your credit card debt. Just sign here. Boom. Welcome to something that resembles the mark of the beast. They've got it. It's not hard to do. Um, will they do that? I don't know. Uh, God, I hope not. Um, I think a lot of the great reset people, uh, the Klaus Schwab, who, by the way, is a Bond villain. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think that crowd, I think part of what they're doing with their fourth industrial revolution is just hoping and praying 
uh, that something will work out for them because they're kind of at the end of their road. Um, their systems are unstable for demographic reasons. You cannot have uh, two working people supporting four retirees. It just won't work. Um, so they're in deep trouble. And I think part of it is that they're maniacal and they really want to make these things work. And part of it is they're just hoping against hope that they can pull a rabbit out of a hat somehow. Uh, you know, and there's people who, um, I don't know, my, myself, I'm, I'm kind of more on the uh, pessimistic end, you know, like how, how imminent could something like this uh, come into play? Some people say, like, I think they have the ability or technology if they wanted to really force it to do it quickly. Other people say it'll take uh, decades. We see some semblance of this already operating uh, in China. You know, and then I have the other question: like, if they do move forward, move forward with this, you know, will it be truly global, mostly global, or kind of like a patchwork? You know, will some countries be operating with this system and others not? You seemed in your articles to focus on the West. And we are really seeing the, the countries that are locked down the most are, you know, like Canada, USA, European countries, Australia, New Zealand. So the, the Western world is the one that's really taking in this uh, great reset tyranny. So, you know, what are your thoughts of how imminent this could be if they di did succeed to some extent? And, you know, would it be global or, or not? Uh, first of all, I don't think it would be global. I, I don't think the Russians would play. I don't think. Um, a lot of other people would play. Uh, a lot of them couldn't play, but would like to. Um, what we need to remember in a lot of this stuff is that power is not omnipotent. Um, we tend to look at these things and, and look through them with kind of sci-fi lenses. Oh my God, they could do this. And they could. Um, they could crash the stock market tomorrow and come up with this, you know, hey, we have a new bank account uh, and you're going to whatever and we'll, and, and we'll forgive all your debt. Um, I don't think they're able to do that. They would like to build sort of a digital, new digital currency. Um, I don't think they're ready to do that, uh, but they have Visa, they've got MasterCard, those are pretty close. Um, they're giant and, and uh, poorly organized, but they work. Um, Still, I don't think they can. And we need to remember that these guys are not geniuses. They're not super powered. They're no better than we are. Matter of fact, they're not as good. Um, if you take, you know, your smart guy who's a, a tech guy or whatever uh, and happens to be unusually bright, the power guys aren't as smart as them. They're not close. They're not that smart. Sometimes they hire smart guys, but they're not that smart. And they're not omnipotent, and they're going to make lots and lots of mistakes, especially when they try something new. Remember, their system, they're admitting that their system is failed. Otherwise, they wouldn't need a great reset. They'd just be telling you that, you know, democracy is the greatest thing that ever was, and our democracy is the pinnacle of world history, and uh, it's so great, and, you know, so on. But they're not. They're saying that they got a reset and they got problems and they they need they're admitting that their system has problems and it does. Thank God that these guys are not hyper geniuses. Um, and there's always so many levels of control. You get uh, in the United States, we've got you know South Dakota and a few uh, in Florida and a few other states, kind of telling the feds to go take a hike, and which is really a very, very good thing. Um, so there's limits to what can be done everywhere. And I do not think it's going to really work, although God knows they could make plenty of mayhem. This is great. You're giving me uh, some optimism and hope. <laughs> you've, you've, <laughs> you've, uh, you've written on, on Bitcoin and seem to be uh, optimistic uh, about it. I'm personally kind of skeptical that Maybe, you know, it may have been created by the elites themselves. We have, you know, that 1988 cover of The Economist, the 1996-97 MIT NSA white paper on electronic uh, currency. And, you know, maybe it's something that 
they created for uh, and then it would eventually serve their purpose perhaps like you mentioned you know the the military created you know the, the internet and gps which we've been using for decades now but now as you mentioned it's become weaponized uh, against us i i don't know but you know what's what's your perspective on uh, cryptocurrency and bitcoin well i uh, first of all i am fully convinced that bitcoin was created by cypherpunks because i was in the crew um, and I watched the pieces come together. Uh, we had, well, before my time, but we had Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, which is what allows encryption to work over the internet, which is just freaking brilliant. Um, and all the pieces came together in and around the cypherpunks movement uh, from, oh, I don't know, 1988, 1990, uh, down through to 2009, 2010, when we got Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is built with a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with Merkle trees, which is a hashing cryptography sort of thing. Um, with BitTorrent, everybody knows what BitTorrent is, where people are downloading songs. That's how Bitcoin uh, transmits its transactions. And BitTorrent was created by cypherpunks. Um, Bram Cohen, uh, Steve Scher, other people. Um, so all of the pieces of Bitcoin came together, Adam Beck's proof of work, the Great Hale Finney's reusable proof of work. Um, all these pieces came together among these people at this time, and somebody calling himself, themselves, herself, Satoshi Nakamoto, put the whole thing together in 2007, 2008, and then dropped it into the world. So I am fully convinced that it was not the NSA or any of those crowd. And if they did, they were just shooting themselves in the foot massively because it is strongly censorship resistant and it's really antithetical to, well, strongly antithetical to, to what they want, which is uh, complete control. Um, so I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. And the importance of Bitcoin is really beyond um, the money itself. Uh, you know, everyone gets excited when the price goes up, um, which, you know, is granted a lovely thing. Um, but the importance of Bitcoin, it is the first large and provable model that decentralization works at, at large scales. Bitcoin scaled trust. It's never been done before. You can now secure absolute trust among unknown parties for things involving millions, billions, trillions of dollars. We've never had that before. This is, is, is proof that decentralization works. And I say that Bitcoin is a gateway drug. Back when I was uh, a young man, uh, people, the old folks of the time, were trying to convince all the kids not to take marijuana because it's a gateway drug. And if you start smoking pot, then pretty soon you're going to be on heroin. And uh, which, of course, wasn't true. But Bitcoin is a gateway drug because what happens is you get people who come into Bitcoin and they say, OK, well, you know, I, I, this is a real opportunity. I've got no opportunity in my life. My dad, my grandfather had a good job at a factory. My dad got along with a few jobs here and there, he had 10 different jobs, but he you know, struggled and made it. And I got no opportunity at all. But here's this thing that looks really interesting and people are making a lot of money on it. I got to get involved. Well, that's I understand that. After they're into, in it for a year or two, however, they begin understanding what this thing really is. This is decentralization of one of the most of the most critical thing of all in modern life, which is currency, the ability to transfer currency. Decentralization works. Oh my God, what if we did decentralization in other things? This is what's important about Bitcoin. The money is nice, but this is what's important. And I can't tell you how wonderful it is to go to these shows and see two, three, four, five hundred young people mainly who get it and who understand and say, now I know. Now I have something that I know what I'm doing and why. I've never had that before in my life. I understand this. 
And I understand why this is important. And I'm going to pour my life and passion into this. God, that's powerful. So could we liken it then, as you said, you know, the financial aspect is nice, but more importantly, you know, people talk about it being a bubble. And then we compare it to the 2000.com bubble where you had all these tech companies um, explode and then most of them died. And then we, we, with the ones that remain, you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook. And so could, would Bitcoin be like this new tech? It's the, like, it's like uh, this new technology, this new foundation for go, what we're going to see going forward that, that, that that's the value it's like this you know it's like a, this new invention like google or the amazon ecosystem that going forward is going to uh create all kinds of crazy and and good things is that like where the value comes from um that will happen uh that to me is not the critical thing and, and it's let me just back up for for a moment and, and say People need to not make comparisons to the dot-com or whatever else. Bitcoin literally cannot go away. Now, I didn't say it will not go away. I'm saying it can not go away. So long as there's electronic communication, and so long as there's two human beings amongst 7 billion or whatever it is that actually think it's interesting, Bitcoin will never, ever go away and all of its features will remain intact. This is not a company that can go broke. This is a protocol. This is a computer program. It doesn't go away. Bitcoin crashed. Oh, my God, did it crash at $3. And oh, my God, did it crash at $30. And oh, my God, did it crash at $250 and $1,000 and at $20,000. Okay. This is because we're measuring it in dollars um, and because of a lot of other factors as well. But it doesn't matter. Bitcoin doesn't go away. It, it can't go away. So it's important to remember that this is a new and different thing. So all of the comparisons we're making to companies or to other currencies even are really wrong. Um, you know, we have to compare it to something to try to make sense out of it. Satoshi had a hard time with that. You read Satoshi's, some of the stuff Satoshi wrote, he says, it's bloody hard to explain this thing. There's nothing to compare it to. And it's true. Uh, Bitcoin isn't particularly difficult, but it is so new and so different that it takes time to wrap your head around it. Uh, so um, will new things come out of it? Yes, they will. Uh, but what really matters is that it is decentralization. We now have, of course, we also had decentralization in the family, um, which is, that's the way all healthy families are. Um, but we have decentralization as a fundamental pillar of a modern and uh, futuristic economy. I, I like to say that Bitcoin is a piece of the future that's invading the present. And it is. Now, you know, Bitcoin isn't perfect. It's, you know, got issues and sometimes you can be tracked if you don't use it carefully. And, you know, it's not a perfection sort of thing. But my God, it's decentralized and it works. And it's making the world better and it's making its users better, yeah. by and large, with the usual exceptions. So Bitcoin is a solution, as you've been discussing, and you know we've already gone over the dark stuff, the, the techno serfdom, and you've written on Freeman's perspective that you want to spend time now going forward on focusing on solutions. And that's, I think, what a lot of us uh, need. Uh, there's people like Derek Bros of the Conscious Resistance, who's created these freedom cells where people can come together in small communities around the world and 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 help each other out, create these networks. And, you know, I just wanted to ask maybe some more ideas from, from yourself, like key principles for people to think about, uh, you know, and how to remain free with everything that's going on. You know, there's like internationalization. I, I'm, I'm pretty internationalized. I've got three passports, you know, planting flags in different places. Uh, you can divert, diversify economically, you know, buying, you know, gold, silver, crypto, whatever, uh, hard assets, practicing good privacy uh, with your computing devices, data, organizing with like-minded people, growing food, uh, opting out of the system. I think what you call going rogue. Some people call it becoming <laughs> uh, becoming ungovernable. Uh, you've, you've mentioned kind of the American redoubt as well, people moving to 
South Dakota or Montana or even, you know, Puerto Rico or, or Florida. So, you know, what are some solutions covering all of these different themes in, in, in practical daily life, you know, that, that you, you've been thinking of, of that we can, you know, apply going forward? Sure. All of those are really good ideas. Maybe I'll want to do one. Maybe you'll want to do another. Maybe uh, somebody else will do yet a third or a fourth or a fifth. All of these, every way we can build a um, sane, decentralized, uh, humane way of life, we need to do it right away. Um, Homeschooling. I'm a huge advocate of homeschooling. Uh, This is really important, one, because it makes your family better. Uh, Number two, uh, your children are better educated with a lot less pain. Uh, And number three, it breaks down the conditioning that says you need society as it is. Um, There's a lot of good information going around. There's a lot of good strategies. All of them should be used. The most important thing, however, is to keep planting good seeds, to teach people uh, without making them join your cause. We, you know, I don't, I don't want to have any ism to sell anybody. And we shouldn't do that. Nobody has to convert to our cause. What we want to do is to plant seeds in people and saying, huh, do you ever think about the fact that that compulsion is the enemy of compassion? Huh. Yeah, you kind of got a point there. What about, you know, people should be left alone to do whatever they want as long as they don't hurt anybody. Huh. Anybody, everyone really kind of believes that if they think about it straight. Uh, children easily believe that. But that just that one statement right there. If people took that statement seriously, if they planted it in themselves and really took it seriously, the world changes next week. Because most of what goes on from the hierarchical level is the opposite of that. It is compulsion as if it were virtue. It's crazy, but that's the way the world works. And it's a Bronze Age model of human organization. And it is so, so far past its expiration date. Once we plant enough seeds and people begin to see things clearly that have something to hold to outside of the political mayhem du jour, then the world changes. People will just stop playing. They'll just stop going along with it. They'll turn down government contracts. You know, if I was if I was um, a oh I don't know a truck driver from you know wherever Montana Mississippi pick your state, um, and I was hoping that Trump could fix something because he was an outsider and yeah I know he's kind of a blowhard, but you know he, he wasn't one of the usual guys and maybe he could fix something and. We'll take, you know, roll the dice on him. And now I'm considered a monster because I did that. Well, you know what? Sorry, I'm not going to deliver any more, any more loads of whatever I deliver inside the beltway. Screw you. I'm done. I'm not going to play your game. If a million truck drivers said, you know what? No more deliveries in the beltway. (laughs) You want to change the world? That changes the world. Um, Will you know the Beltway crowd adapt and, and put Army boys in, in trucks driving? Yeah, sure, I'm sure they would. Um, but these are the type of things you get the right ideas in people's head, and they will put them to use themselves, and that's where the power comes from. You you mentioned this compulsion as virtue, which we're seeing a lot with this whole COVID. From phenomenon, these mandatory, you know, you got to wear face masks and then people who refuse, don't want to wear a face mask being shamed by, you know, whatever they, they call them, the Karens. And, and you, you've written right. that. Yeah. And you've written the life, that the life of meek uh, obedience is a sin against uh, self and that, you know, living dangerously is living rightly. And I've always had that uh, kind of a philosophy and I've just gone out into the world uh, lived around in, in, in different countries and, you know, not having health insurance or, or, or this or that. And I, I kind of prefer living, you know, dangerously rather than being in kind of like a cage. And, you know, you know, what is it that differentiates this, this minority that, 
calls out our fraudulent uh, politicians and you know fearlessly defends freedom and lives dangerously versus you know this majority who sheepishly accept whatever they're told uh, you know even willfully allowing themselves to be subjugated and, and humiliated you know how do we break through how do we how do we get more people to join the the living dangerously crowd tell them how much fun it is tell them how cool it feels how good it feels to know that you're living your life uh, does it always succeed no we crash and burn too sometimes okay well bad luck but i'm alive man I, I, i'm not just following the guy in front of me and doing whatever everyone else says i'm not afraid yeah i'm afraid of little things sometimes but i don't live in fear and I got to tell you, it feels wonderful. And you know what? You can do it too. It's not that hard. They only made us feel like it was so scary that we're all going to die if we leave the collective. It ain't true. I'm out here and it's glorious. Come on with me. That kind of thing. All right. Yeah, that, that, that's really that's really good. I'm going to start applying that <laughs> a bit more. Uh, um, and talking about more ways of protecting yourself, uh, also from the tech aspect, but first kind of starting with, with a, you know, a VPN and um, you have a VPN service. I've kind of been eyeing it for years, but um, have kind of shied away from it because of its uh, price. But that might be changing because, you know, I've gone through a number of VPNs, all of which are, you know, like the name brand popular ones. I was, I was living in Kazakhstan and I, I had my first VPN a, in Kazakhstan after six months it stopped uh, functioning because the government blocked it. I mean, I, I even had a router that uh, had the, the, what do you call it? The firmware uh, that had the VPN in the router that it, it, it just wouldn't work. And so I purchased a second VPN, you know, the, one of the name brand ones. And they, mm -hmm. and promptly again, the government uh, was messing with it and, and, and blocking the second VPN final. And then the government blocked my private email service. It, it's banned in Russia and Kazakhstan. It doesn't function on the ISP. Uh, there uh, and so finally, I got a third VPN that has was you know has been working in in Kazakhstan. But you know even now uh, I'm currently in, in Mexico, and I think it's also essential everywhere wherever you are. Because for example, in Mexico we have organized crime that's infiltrated, working in all institutions. You know we got narcos uh, in government, probably at the telecommunications companies as well. And so, you know, you need to protect yourself uh, f f from their eyes. And, you know, I, I re I'm realizing now that it's wiser not to use the more popular VPNs, uh, especially because now every time I enter into Twitter, it's asking you to do these uh, captchas or, or prove that you're not a robot. And I think the lesser known or boutique brands maybe help uh, avoid that. So could you tell us, you know, about the importance of VPN, crypto hippie, as well as, you know, what are some other key uh, ways one should protect themselves, th their data, their privacy from the social credit score or, or, or whatever? Right. All right. Well, I'll start with VPNs. If you get a VPN, um, it, is it is essential that you get one that's put out by people who are serious about privacy. You must have multiple hops. If not, it really is of minimal use. It'll help. Uh, it'll help from the teenage hacker in in the back of the Starbucks, uh, but it's really not going to help. Remember, when you're when you're playing with privacy, you're trying to get privacy. You're facing off against very well funded professionals. These are serious people that want to take all of your data. It's it's you know how much funding does the NSA have or the G A G C H Q or the Russian or French or whomever equivalents? They've got billions of dollars and they want your data. They want everyone's data. It's not just the data on bad guys. They want everything because that's how their analytics work. They used to say, "Well, you can't drink from a fire hose." Well, sorry, but big data loves the fire hose. It wants a bigger high fire hose. So um, everybody wants it. Remember, you're playing with professionals here. And a lot of the VPNs, almost every VPN out there, almost every one you'll have to check on yours, whatever it is, does not have multiple hops. And, and that's just a single hop proxy. They were very cool in the 1990s, but they're not so cool now. Um, 
So you need multiple hops. You need somebody that has their own key infrastructure. You know, you don't have to understand exactly what that is. But in the Snowden documents, we learned that the NSA was blowing through all through. Well, they had blown through 300 VPNs on their way to 300. And, you know, people inside the business, we know pretty much what they were doing, and it was subverting the key infrastructure. So if you don't, your VPN doesn't have its own key infrastructure, then it's really not terribly uh, helpful. So you need a professional VPN. It's not that much money. So people need to do that. And if you, if you don't, well, that's fine. But don't think that you're really safe because you're not. So you should know that. Um, after that, to get away from the matrix, it's not that hard, but it's going to be things that people don't want to do. And it's not going to cost them money, but they don't want to do it because they're committed to it. And what I mean is you've got to throw away your smartphone and go get an old flip phone because the smartphone is a surveillance device. That's what it is. I mean, how can you have free apps? Somebody, you need programmers to build apps. They got to get paid. You need people, engineers to keep the system running to get all that free data into you. And that, that's expensive. It's not cheap. I mean, you know, try to employ an engineer and see how much it costs you. Um, so how can you have a free app? You get the free app because they steal your life. They get everything from your phone where you are, when you're there, who you're communicating with, who they communicate once you're done talking to them, and on and on and on. So social media, uh, at least Twitter, Facebook, and you know the usuals, are parasites. They're vampire parasites. And I know uh, I lay that on people, and it's too much for them to take, and I apologize. I'm not trying to be a schmuck, um, but that's the way it is. If you want to use social media, use Mastodon. Mastodon is a federal, federated sort of social media system uh, that doesn't, it's, you know, kind of a hobbyist sort of system. There's a lot of people on it. It's not tiny, but it's that model rather than the, we are going to take your, you know, information and make a billion dollars on it. Um, so those are the things that people have to do. God forbid you use Google. Don't touch them. I mean, don't touch them at all. Do not use Google for searches. Use DuckDuckGo. It does the same thing. It's better in some ways. Um, don't touch these people. Anything that's giving you a free account that's bringing in a billion or 10 billion or 100 billion dollars a year is, uh, forgive my language, they're raping you. Um, that's what they do. So... Um, Again, I apologize for being strident on this, but, you know, I've been in the business for a lot of years and I've seen what they do and it's not pretty. So escape them. I think people need this, you know, slap in the face, this cold bucket of, of water, because I mean, it's it's very serious, you know, and it's funny. Last week, I just revived my my dumb phone. And I'm planning, uh, you know, <laughs> soon to nuke nuke WhatsApp now, WhatsApp and uh, I haven't been using Google for years. It's just like you said, uh, I don't use anything for free anymore. You got to pay for these services, email services, um, you know, cloud storage, uh, uh, as you said, VPN or whatever. We, we need to do these things. And it's not so bad on the other side now. You know, I, I'm jumping to the alternate platforms. Uh, the podcast has a Telegram channel now that's that, that's growing. And, you know, we're, we're on MeWe and Gab and Minds and there's people there. There's little communities beginning to form. So, it's, you know, it's there's life on the other side. There's it's not just right. WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 not bad. It, you get to the other side. I remember I, I threw away my television. Uh, oh gosh, this is a lot of years ago. Uh, I, I watch I watch certain things now, but I you know, at one point I just threw the damn threw the damn thing away and. Um, after the first week or so getting used to it, afterwards you find, oh, I've got a lot of time. I can do stuff. Oh, this isn't so bad. And uh, it's the same thing with this stuff. You really don't need it. I mean, come on. We survived really well in the 70s and 80s and 90s before people had anything like an internet. We did fine. 
we, you know, we got married and fell in love and had children and worked jobs and had refrigerators and air conditioning and cars. I mean, you know, everything was okay. So, you know, this stuff is not absolutely necessary. And, and you know, smartphones don't have to be evil. You could build a, a, a good smartphone. Uh, and I'm really waiting for somebody who will. Um, they don't have to be parasite devices. They're, and there's nothing wrong with talking to your friends. Uh, it's just that the, the king bee parasites um, got a hold of this and realized that they could use the oldest trick in the book. Here, kid, there's some free candy in the car uh, to, to sucker people in. And to and once they were there, I mean, these guys hire psychiatrists. You understand they they have psychiatrists and psychologists and all sorts of that to figure out how to keep people addicted to their service. And you know, it's it's the mania of the age, but it, it has worked. Um, but stepping away from it after the first step, it's easy and in a lot of ways liberating. Uh, I, I, I cringe when I see young people with the cell phones that beep at them every every 10 seconds. You talk about a way to interrupt serious thought, to interrupt con, uh, uh, you know, any any sort of serious mental work, you know, interrupt them. That's that's how you destroy, you know, good work. So the, the phones that beep all the time, Matt, whenever you get a text or an email or something, wow, it's anathema to me. I couldn't do my work that way. Yeah, I've turned off all notifications. I I look at it when I want to, not when it wants me to. And speaking right. of and speaking of the smartphones as well, you know, I, I years ago I bought the Silent Circles uh, black phone, and I was <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, it was for me it's a dud. Like it wasn't uh, very good. And then I've interviewed the CEO of Purism, who's uh, working on the the Librem, the Linux based phone, but I'm still waiting right. on that. I, I haven't been convinced the price is too high, and I don't know how workable it is. And there's you know critical reviews on it and so i, I the, the only computers are good by the way the, the laptops the yeah. libra the libra computers they're good oh okay maybe i'll look into that uh my, my only other alternative for now use the dumb phone or uh de google uh, the smartphone uh mm -hmm. i guess so right um, I, I don't know if you have any Final thoughts then uh, for us as we continue um, uh, watching with, you know, popcorn and, and, and what's going to happen in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing I will say is that once we get over the present stuff that's going on, if we can get past um, this Bronze Age model of human organization, where we have a few people at the top of, a, of a, an abusive hierarchy who tell everyone else what to do and punish those who don't and take their money and call it righteous. Once we get past that, then life is golden. Um, humanity will expand and will evolve like it never has before. Um, it won't be perfect by any way because we're not ready for you know, we, we make our own problems a lot of times. We're not fully developed. But my God, it will be like stepping into a new world because there's so much energy. There's so much entropy in these systems. So when once, once we step out of them in any significant way, the things that will come out of it will be wonderful. Life will get massively better. It's just a wrong model. The hierarchy, the dominance hierarchy, the status hierarchy, the listen, the, the fundamental statement of, of government is do what we say or we'll hurt you. I mean, we don't say it that way because it sounds a little harsh, but that's behind every law. That's behind all of these things. Do what we say or we'll hurt you. Now, they can say, yeah, well, we say so because of the will of the people. Or we say so because of, you know, uh, divine right of kings or, you know, democracy, democracy, democracy or whatever. Um, but it really comes down to do what we say or we'll hurt you. That's a stupid way to organize beings as incredible as humans. Uh, these creative, inherently morally centered sort of people, you know, with a few exceptions here and there. Um, it's crazy. Once we get past it, humanity's golden. So keep that in mind.
you just reminded me it's 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 exactly as you said do what we say or we're going to hurt you and you know it, uh, not the will of the people but the the will of the pharmaceutical company that's writing the 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 paycheck to the politicians uh here in exactly. mexico they, they had these restrictions recently where anyone 60 years or older was not allowed into the to the supermarkets and my my father-in-law was denied from entering the supermarket to buy food. And it's just like, are you serious? So he can't go in because he's going to get the virus or whatever, but now he can't buy food, so he's going to starve. It's just like... Yeah, that, that helps a lot, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. It's a crazy time. So uh, where, where's the best place for people to follow your work? I know you're on freemansperspective.com. Uh, anywhere else? Right. That's it, freemansperspective.com. And uh, for Crypto Hippie, it's CryptoHippie.com, just the way it sounds. All right. I'll put the links in the description. So Paul Rosenberg's Free Men's Perspective. Uh, it's a great website and publication, a newsletter. Uh, and as well, I'll be checking out once my uh, current VPN service expires. I think I, I might be hopping over to Crypto Hippie. We'll, we'll see. Uh, and thanks for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire interview and podcast. I would like to remind you that our website is geopoliticsandempire.com and you can sign up for our free mailing list that goes out each weekend with the latest podcast and a long collection of important news headlines. It's good to sign up for the newsletter because we are actively being censored and deplatformed. You can help the podcast by subscribing to and interacting with all of our media channels, which include BitChute, Brighton, Odyssey or LBRY, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Twitter, Telegram, Minds, Gab, MeWe, Float, and VK. Our Facebook page is restricted, and our YouTube and Instagram are most likely marked for death. One big way to help us is by leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you value our work and our mission and would like to see us continue interviewing experts from across the political spectrum, please consider leaving a one-time donation via crypto, PayPal, uh, or become a regular monthly supporter on our Subscribestar. All the links can be found on geopoliticsandempire.com or guadalajaragiopolitics.com. Thanks for listening.